All right, uh, thanks a lot for coming out today to the talk. I really appreciate it. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the uncertainty principle. And so I hope that after today, you'll have a good sense of what the uncertainty principle is, what it really means, and why it's true. So roughly speaking, the uncertainty principle is a beautiful result in physics, in quantum mechanics, which essentially says that you cannot arbitrarily well localize the position and the momentum of a particle at a given point in time. So as this is a math talk, we'll actually be proving something about a function and its Fourier transform, but this result is actually equivalent to the physics result and we'll be touching upon how you can interpret the result in a physics setting. So uh, in order to get started, we have to do a quick review on probability, so density functions, expectation, variances, and the like, and then we'll quickly introduce the Fourier transform and set some notation for the complex numbers, and then we'll be able to state and prove the theorem. So uh, let's get started. So today we'll be talking about functions f that go from the real numbers to the complex numbers. And so for complex numbers, we'll write them as, or we'll think of them as a plus bi, where a and b are both real numbers, and i is just the square root of negative 1. And so two notions that we will use are the uh, absolute value of a complex number, uh, which is if you have a plus bi, the absolute value is just the square root of a squared plus b squared. And then we'll also talk about the complex conjugate of a complex number. And so if you have a plus bi, the complex conjugate is just a minus bi. And so one thing you can deduce immediately is that if you take a number and multiply it by its complex conjugate, you get the absolute value of the number squared. And so I encourage you to work through that uh, in your heads. You just foil out the terms, and everything falls into place. So uh, we'll be talking about functions f, but the quantity that we'll really be concerned with is you take the absolute value of f of x squared. And you'll want to think of this like a probability density function. So along those lines, we'll be imposing one more restriction on our functions today. And that is <coughs> when you take this quantity that we care about and integrate it over the whole real line, you get back exactly 1. And this is not too much stronger of a requirement than just requiring that this integral be finite. Because if that's the case, you can always divide f by an appropriate constant in order to ensure that it, the integral ends up being 1, as long as the integral is not 0. Uh, <coughs> So with this in mind, just to get refreshed about, uh, actually one more thing I'll say is that we'll be talking about these integrals from minus infinity to infinity of our functions uh, throughout all the talk today. And so I've written up uh, the last two lines on the board over there are some assumptions on our functions that you always want to have in the back of your minds. So just assume that uh, the function, its derivative, and its Fourier transform uh, have those bounds there. Uh, <clears throat> and this is just to ensure that these integrals that we talk about always converge, and so we don't have to worry about that in any of our analysis. So I guess to get a simple example for a probability density function, let's define the density function for a coin toss. So we'll call it g, and we'll call a heads 1. And so g will just give the probability that we get a heads is 1, uh, 1 half. So that's g of, one, uh, g of 1 is 1 half. And then similarly for a tails, we'll call that 0. And the probability of getting a tails is also 1 half. And so you'll notice some similar things between the g function, the simple case, and the uh, quantity we care about. First of all, you always get non-negative values out of the g function. And the absolute value of f of x squared is always non-negative, as it's an absolute value. Uh, next, you'll notice that when you add up all the different possible values you can get out of g, you get 1. <coughs> that's a common feature to all probability density functions. And that's really the same thing that we're imposing here, uh, except it's in the continuous setting, so we're using integration rather than summation. So we're just requiring that over all possible outcomes, when you sum up the probabilities, you get 1. So continuing in this fashion, if we were going to try to define the expectation of this coin toss, we'd probably do something like 0 times g of 0 plus 1 times g of 1 equals 1 half. And so what you can see we're doing here is just taking all possible outcomes and multiplying the outcome times the probability the outcome happens. So if we were to define analogously the expectation of a random variable having this probability density function, we would define it as following integral uh, dx. And so here, again, what we're doing is we're just saying take the outcome and multiply it by the density and integrate that over all possible values. And so if you were to continue in this fashion, you'd see that the most natural way to define the variance of a random variable having 
this density would be uh, the following. Um, so, following integral, uh, x minus e squared f of x squared dx. And so here we're just moving from an x to an x squared. And you can pretend this e is 0, but it's usually a natural thing to center the variance around this expectation, which we've already computed. So with these notions in mind, we've got a good refresher of probability. And so we'll quickly talk uh, about the Fourier transform. So we'll introduce it right here. So given a function f, we, uh, we'll define its Fourier transform, and we'll denote it f hat. And we'll say f hat is a function of c. And that's just to remind ourselves that we've changed the function in some uh, significant way. It's, it, we could have x here, but this is just to remind ourselves that we're in the Fourier transform setting. So we'll set this equal to following integral. <clears throat> so, uh, so this is the expression for the Fourier transform of f evaluated at c. And you can see it's truly a variable or a function uh, of just c because we integrate out this x. And so the only variable which f hat depends on is c here. And so really what this is doing is this term always has absolute value 1. And if you're familiar with thinking about the complex plane, as we bring x from minus infinity to infinity, this quantity here circles around the unit circle. And when we increase c, it cycles around faster and faster as we bring x from minus infinity to infinity. So I like to think of the Fourier transform as somehow picking up the frequencies of f, uh, depending on how we choose the c. So in order to get our hands a little bit dirty so we're kind of used to doing computations with the Fourier transform, we will prove the third identity on the board over there, which I haven't named, but it's, you'll see it follows very, uh, fairly quickly from the definition. Uh, and so this will, just, this will just prepare us to uh, go through the proof of the uncertainty principle. So uh, we can really work <coughs> right from the definition. So we'll start with f prime of x hat, just using exactly this representation here is the following integral. And so here you can see we've got an integral term. And on the inside, we've got so the derivative of some function. And we clearly want to relate it to this notation, where we have the antiderivative of f prime. And so there's a really natural way to sort of bring f up in that sense, and that's to use integration by parts. So Assuming that the limit exists, this is really meant to be understood as the same integral from minus n to n in the limit as n goes to infinity. And this uh, limit will exist by our assumptions on f and f prime. So let's work with uh, the minus n to n case in order to apply the integration by parts. <clears throat> so we start here, and then we apply the integration by parts formula. And so we'll have this be our u and this be our dv. So the first term is the boundary term, where u is unchanged. And we bring f up to its antiderivative. And this is evaluated at the boundary. And then we have the integral term, which is the same, but we take the derivative now of this term. And so it's e to the blank times x. And so we just get blank e to the blank times x. Um, <coughs> so here we get the coefficient of x times what we had before. And so uh, by our assumptions on f that, that f decays to 0 as we take uh, x going to plus or minus infinity, when we take the limit as n goes to infinity of both sides, this term completely drops out. We don't have to worry about it. And then these minus signs also cancel. Um, <clears throat> and so. You can see that here we've just got a constant because we're integrating with respect to x. So we can bring this out, and that's totally fine. And so I'll just write that like this. And then you can see what we have left inside of the integral is exactly our definition for the Fourier transform of f evaluated at c. And so with this, we have uh, proved exactly the third identity on the board. We have the 2 pi i c times the Fourier transform of f evaluated at c. So. Uh, <coughs> Everyone's good with that. I will erase this. And uh, so now we've got a sense for how computations with the Fourier transform go in some cases. And so one more thing I will say about the Fourier transform before we move on is uh, 
I will bring up the second identity on the board over there, which is the Plancherel theorem, which says that when you take this quantity that we care about and you integrate it from minus infinity to infinity, this quantity here, so this should have a dx, sorry. Uh, this quantity is unchanged if you replace f with its Fourier transform. And so what that says is, well, the Fourier transform changes the function in some clearly significant way. It preserves a nice property, and that's the square integral that we've been talking about. <coughs> so uh, with all of these notions in mind, we are ready to state and discuss the uncertainty principle. And so I'll change this, change just a few letters, say theorem, the uncertainty principle. So <coughs> assuming that we have the same assumptions about our function that we've been living with this whole time, namely those uh, two on the bottom line on the board over there, and this integral assumption here, we'll say uh, for any x naught, c naught, which are just real numbers, we have. So the following inequality holds. So this term <coughs> uh, is the, the variance of our density function f, our absolute value of f of x squared, around the point x naught. And this term And this is the variance of, so you take the Fourier transform, and then you use the same quantity that we care about, and you cal calculate the variance of that function around any point c naught. The product of these two variances is always greater than or equal to 1 over 16 pi squared. And so this is an amazing fact, first and foremost, because we have so much control over each of these terms, terms individually. You can imagine you could pick f to be some function that looks somewhat like this, and we'll do a demonstration later. But here, this would be bringing the variance of f really close into one point. <clears throat> and so what that tells us is that when we take the Fourier transform of f and we take the absolute value squared and compute the variance, we must be getting, uh, or not computing the variance, but just taking the absolute value of f hat of c squared, we must be getting a function that looks something like this so that we're preserving this uh, lower bound. And so I will touch on how this applies to physics now. So it turns out that in physics, uh, different properties of particles are not understood as exact values, but they're understood as density functions. And so to each particle is associated a wave function, and that's our f. And it turns out that if you have the wave function f, then this quantity gives you the density function for the position of the particle, and this function gives you the density for the momentum of the particle. And so what this tells us is that if you take our, uncertain, our uncertainty of the position of the particle times our uncertainty of the momentum of the particle, and you multiply these two values together, it's always bounded below by a constant. <clears throat> and so that imposes serious restrictions on how much we can know about a certain particle at a certain time. So a very tangible uh, realization of this is consider a note being played on a piano. So if the note is played for a very long time, then it's not very certain in time when the note occurred, but you can be more and more certain about what the note was. The longer you hear the note on a piano, the more sure you are of what note was actually played. But as you shorten that window of time in which you hear the note, you become less and less sure about what the note was, but you get more sure about where exactly in time it occurred. So it's very hard to tell the pitch of a snap, but you know almost exactly where in time it occurred. So hopefully that gives you somewhat of a sense for intuitively what this uncertainty principle is saying. And so as this is a math talk, uh, we will certainly be proving this uncertainty principle in, uh, in full generality. And so it seems like the easiest case to, to prove would be the case where x naught and c naught are both zero. And so we'll start there, and it turns out you can get the full result by a change of variables. So, so let's restrict ourselves to proving the case where x naught and c naught are both zero. So in order to start the proof, we can start with what we know, and that is the following. Based on our assumptions on uh, our function, we have this equality uh, right off the bat. And so this seems like a good place to start because we have a constant on one side and an integral term involving absolute value of f of x squared on the other side. So it seems like a reasonable place to start. So we certainly want some x terms to be popping out here. And so there's kind of a tricky way we can do this, and it's similar to what we did before. And so the tricky part is you write this integrand as 1 times itself. You can certainly do that. And then from here, uh, the, the nice thing is that we can now apply integration by parts again to this term. And so 
Uh, much like how uh, our computations earlier went for the Fourier transform, uh, the third identity, the boundary term of the uh, integration by parts ends up dropping out because of the decay of our functions. And so when we apply integration by parts to this term, we're left with just the resulting integral term. And so I'll write that on the next line. So we're going to have this be our dv and this be our u. So we bring uh, dv up to v, so that's just x. And then here's where we're going to use what we said earlier about uh, the absolute value of a complex number. So we have the following equality, f of x complex conjugate. And so the, the benefit of this is that we know how to differentiate this term uh, a little bit better than we do this term. So here uh, we can apply the product rule and just say that derivative of this is derivative of the first times the second plus the first times and then one thing I'll quickly say is that with functions of a real variable, you can commute taking the derivative and taking the complex conjugation. Uh, and this, is, this can easily be seen if you just write f of x as u of x plus i times v of x, where u and v are both uh, real valued functions of a real variable. So it really falls into place after you express f that way. Uh, so all that's to say that we can write this next term as we can bring the uh, derivative inside of the complex conjugation. So. Yes. Uh, yeah, either way, but, but yeah, because it's the, the uh, integration by parts formula is boundary term minus the integral term. Yes, thank you. So here we can see that uh, to proceed, it would certainly be OK. So we have a constant here, and then we have integral terms, and this is less than or equal to. So it would certainly be OK as we have a constant here if we were to have a less than or equal to sign going on to the next line. So. To use this to our advantage, we can apply a somewhat rudimentary bound and just say that, well, this term is equal to 1, so it's equal to its absolute value. But the, or the absolute value of an integral is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value. And so we can say this term is less than or equal to and move the absolute value inside. And then we'll break up the absolute value into absolute value of this times absolute value of this. And then we'll use the triangle inequality to break up this term further. So this is then going to become absolute value of this plus absolute value of this. And you can clearly convince yourself that the absolute value of the complex conjugate of a number is the same as the absolute value of the number itself, because when you have minus b and you square it, you still get b squared. So that's all to say that we can remove these bars when we split this up using the triangle inequality. And so what you can see then is we clearly have just two copies of f prime of x times f of x. And so putting that all together. This is what we are left with. And so this is starting to look very good. Uh, we've now got an x and an f of x. We have an f prime popping out, but perhaps we can use the third identity on the board at some point. Uh, but one thing you'll notice right now is we have one integral term, and we have a lot of terms to the power 1. <coughs> and so we'd like to have more than one integral term and terms to the power 2. And so a very natural next step uh, seems to be to use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which I'll introduce now. Uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is a very classic result, uh, which can actually be proved in a much more general setting than the setting we're working in right now. Uh, and I won't prove it, but I'm, I'm happy to talk about the proof at any time, uh, as well as uh, any other of the statements, or I guess uh, I'm happy to talk about the proof of the Planchville theorem as well. Uh, but in the interest of time, we won't prove this result, and we will take it as given. Uh, and so what it says, you can see, is when you have an integral of this type of a product, you can split up the integral into two integrals, provided that you square the integrands and then take the square roots of the outside of like the overall integrals. So if we're going to apply this inequality, the question becomes, how do we split up the integrand? So what's our f and what's our g from over there? And so you can see the problem is if we leave uh, absolute value of x alone, we'll have a term that's integral from minus infinity to infinity of the absolute value of x, which is clearly going to be infinity. And that doesn't seem like it'll help us in uh, achieving our goal. And so over here, we have x's paired with f of x's. And so it seems like a natural decision to keep these two terms together. And then we might be lucky with this term later on in using the third identity. And so we can leave it by itself. So uh, next step is exactly apply the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality with this being our f and this being our g from over there. <coughs> and so that gives the following. So we square the inside. Then we have the g term. 
Or sorry. <clears throat> Write this a little clear. F prime of x squared dx to one half. So as we're proving the case where x naught and c naught are both zero, this is the exact term that we want on the left half of the product over here. So we have to do a little bit more work with this term. So this is where the two identities on the board over here come to mind and seem to be very useful. The first one says that to preserve this, uh, if we want to preserve this quantity, it's OK if we replace f prime with its Fourier transform. And the third inequality tells us exactly what the Fourier transform of f prime is. So we can apply those two pieces of information uh, at once. So we say, OK, we're going to take the Fourier transform of what's in here, and then we're going to expand as we know what the Fourier transform of f prime is. So we can bring this term down. And so we're just going to replace f prime with this Fourier transform and write out exactly what that is, which is 2 pi i c f hat of c squared dc to the 1 half. And then this term comes down exactly how it was before. And we still have a 2 here. And so at this point, we can deal with our constants a little bit. This i has no impact, as it has absolute value 1. And we're taking the absolute value here. Uh, let's bring the 2 pi out. So we bring the 2 pi out of the absolute value. It becomes a 4 pi squared, because we have a squared here. Take it out of the integral at no cost. Take it outside of these parentheses. We have a square root, so it goes back down to a 2 pi. So now we've got a 2 pi here. Hits the 2 and becomes a 4 pi. And so then we can just divide these constants over to the other side, as we have that 1 is less than or equal to all this. So we can say this implies that 1 over 4 pi is less than or equal to. And now we've dealt with our constants. So we can get rid of those. And <clears throat> so now there's, I meant to drop down this square root as well. And so now there's only one more step to get the first result, and that's to square both sides. And so now we've proven the exact result in the case where x0 and c0 are both 0. Uh, so this is great. And what is there left to do but uh, roll up our sleeves and prove the general case? So I'll erase this. And we can start up again over here. <coughs> so in order to prove the general case, it turns out you can actually do a clever change of variables, which essentially ends up being a shift of f and a shift of f hat. And so We'll write this out. So given f of x, which we want to prove the theorem for, so we also have x0 and c0 given, we're going to say let g of x equal e to the minus 2 pi i x c0 f of x plus x0. So first thing uh, to note is that all of the assumptions that we have on f still hold for g. Certainly the decay properties hold because this term has absolute value 1, and then we've just got a shifted copy of f by some finite number, so that's totally fine. And then the next thing we'll notice is that uh, this integral assumption that we have, where this integral equals 1, that will still hold because, again, this has absolute value 1. And when we do the integral of this, we can just apply the change of variables, let y equal x plus x naught, uh, and you'll get the exact same integral, and so it'll still equal 1. So uh, that tells us that this integrality that we've proven here applies to g, and so we'll write that out. So we know that this is greater than or equal to 1 over 16 pi squared. And so this is great. So when we want to expand g and maybe write it in terms of f, then we bring this term down. So this is all the same. And I'll leave myself some room here. So when we take the absolute value, this term will drop out. It has absolute value 1. And so we're left here with just f of x plus x naught squared dx. And so one thing we can do immediately is we can just apply the change of variables, let y equal x plus x naught. So then dy equals dx. And so 
If y is x plus x naught, then x is equal to y minus x naught. x plus x naught is just y. And now we're integrating dy. And so this is great because uh, this is exactly what we have on the left side over here. And y is just the name of the variable that we're integrating out now. And so we can certainly just rename it x. Although it's a different x from up here, but we're just changing the name of the variable y to x so that our result exactly matches what we stated. And so now we have uh, the exact term that we wanted in our original inequality over there. And so we have to do a little bit of work with this term. So, so we want to take the Fourier transform of this g function. So I'll start working uh, right here, I think. <coughs> and we want to hopefully relate the Fourier transform of g to the Fourier transform of f so that we can get the general inequality. So the easiest way to do this is we're just going to work with the exact definition of the Fourier transform and plug our g function in. So g hat of c is equal to the exact integral definition that we had before. So then now we have e to the minus 2 pi i x c naught f of x plus x naught dx. And so we can consolidate these e terms here in the next line. So we're multiplying by x both times. So this can just become i times x plus x naught. Or sorry, uh, my mistake. Multiplying by x both times so we can consolidate the c and the c naught times f of x plus x naught dx. And now we'll do the same change of variables that we did over here. So y equals x plus x naught, dy equals dx. <coughs> to get that uh, following integral. So e to the minus 2 pi i times. So now x becomes y minus x naught. And here we have c plus c naught times f of y, and now we're integrating dy. And so now what we can do is we can pull out everything in this integral that doesn't uh, depend on y. So, <clears throat> so what can we pull out? Well, we can pull out the coefficient up here that's x naught times this term. So these minus signs here cancel because we have minus x naught and minus there. So this is just e to the 2 pi i times x naught times c plus c naught times the following integral, e to the minus 2 pi i. And now we have y times c plus c naught f of y dy. And so all of this work is to show that we have this constant that we don't care about that much, but it's of absolute value 1, so that's good. Uh, and this is exactly the definition for the Fourier transform of f evaluated at c plus c naught. You can see here we have everything is exactly the same, except we have a c plus c naught instead of uh, just c. So all that's to say that we can write uh, g hat of c as this constant times f hat of c plus c naught. So we can, uh, and we can reduce this a little further before we write it out. And again, we said this constant has absolute value 1. And just to uh, say this, if I hadn't said it before, that's because it's e to the i times some t, where t is real. So, so that constant drops out, and we're left with just f hat of c plus c naught squared dc. And now we can do the exact same change of variables that we had over here. Uh, so you can see we got something very similar to what we had before. So we will say let <coughs> y equal c plus c naught. So again, dy equals dc. And so then we can drop this down here exactly how it is. And so then c becomes y minus c naught <coughs> squared absolute value of f hat of now y squared and now we're integrating dy. And just like before, y is just the name of the variable that we're integrating out. 
So we can just rename it C. And <clears throat> so I meant to have, uh, yep, so, so this step implies that then this is 1 over 16 greater than or equal to 1 over 16 pi squared. And so as these things are all equal all the way down, which uh, was what we were trying to preserve, then this inequality still applies to these alternative representations. And so here we have proved exactly the uncertainty principle in the general case, which is what we hope to prove. And so <coughs> uh, this is great. And so what we can do next is look for an example of some functions obeying this uncertainty principle in the wild. And so I've got a short demonstration of this. So we'll bring down the board. <clears throat> All right. Should pop up. There we go. Great. So here's going to be our f, and here's our uh, f hat for a transform. And so this is sigma is just a parameter that we can fix before we then take the Fourier transform. And so you can see that these functions kind of look like Gaussians. They're a little bit differently normalized up in the numerator here. But it turns out that if you take a Gaussian, so that's a, a distribution function for a normal random variable, and you take the Fourier transform, you get back another Gaussian with different parameters. And so in order to see uh, this equality, if this is f and this is f hat, you first prove the case where sigma is equal to 1. And then you can calculate uh, f hat um, by writing out the integral for the Fourier transform, then differentiating under the integral sign, and you will get a differential equation that the solution will have to satisfy, and you can solve from there. Uh, and so then to go from there to getting the case where you have any sigma greater than or equal to 0, you just use the identity that uh, f of delta x hat is equal to delta inverse f hat of delta inverse c. And this can really be seen just by a change of variables in the uh, integration, kind of like what we've seen so far. So it's not, it's not horrible to show that, that if this is f, then this is f hat. And so uh, we, these functions then are the functions that go inside of our variance integrals. And so what I've plotted here is this blue function is uh, this function. And the uh, red one here is the absolute value of f hat of c squared for a given value of sigma, which we can manipulate up here. And so you can uh, argue to yourself that um, when sigma is very small, then the <coughs> as this kind of looks like a Gaussian with variance sigma squared, uh, when sigma is small, uh, f will have a very small variance, as we can see here. And then as we, if I can find the mouse, as we vary uh, sigma, we can see these functions changing and obeying the uncertainty principle for every level of sigma that we choose. So as we bring sigma bigger, it makes the variance of the blue function uh, much bigger, and the variance of the red function can become smaller. And so these functions are very special because in the case where we choose sigma is equal to 1, uh, so then these functions are the same. You can just plug in sigma equals 1 and see that these functions are the same. And when you compute these variance integrals for the same function, you get 1 over 4 pi for both of them. And so you can see that the lower bound that we had just proved is actually achieved. And so in general, this lower bound cannot be improved upon. So I hope now that you've got a very good sense for what the uncertainty principle says and why it's true and what it really means and how functions obey the uncertainty principle in the wild. So thanks a lot for coming. Thank you.